When you think of Indian wisdom, two images come to mind. First, a golden age, you know, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the, you know, Vedic gods and goddesses, the Buddha sitting under a Bodhi tree. You know, this, this image of Indian wisdom is the first one. The second one is our very modern Indian gurus. Now, when you think about our gurus, I mean, in the last 120 years, our gurus have been one of our major exports from India. You know, we are great at producing gurus. There's no doubt about that. And here's a little family of them. So, <laughs> and, but, you know, Indian wisdom has a far more sort of, you know, messy, you know, history than that. And when you think about it, it's, it's full of rebels and reformers and rethinking and reimagination. And that's what I want to talk about, reimagination. So when you think about it, look at all the concepts that we share around the world today, karma, yoga, tantra. You know, these are all products of the Indian imagination. They are not something sealed in some golden past. So when I look at it, look at the Buddha, for example. Um, you know, here he was. He found a cure for suffering. And then he shared it. And his first students were the rich kids of Benares, the merchant's children. And he was the first therapist in a way. You know, when you think about it, you look at um, 1893, Swami Vivekananda goes to America to the Parliament of Religions in Chicago, and he becomes the, um, the first American guru. That is the original poster of America when he went there. And when you think about it, then in 1952, we have BKS Iyengar, who takes a small school of yoga called Hatha Yoga from India, takes it to the West, and today it's a $64 billion industry. I mean, we, this reimagination has had a tremendous impact. So what is it about Indian wisdom that keeps it being reimaginable? What is it that Indian wisdom can give to today's world? You know, social network, quantum entangled, you know, uh, high-speed broadband, dissatisfied world we live in today. So I have thought about this, and I've come up with five concepts I want to share with you that starts with the first one is that everything is mind, consciousness. Now, this is a fundamental Indian idea. And the idea is that tatvam asi, your consciousness and the consciousness of the whole universe are one. You are that. And you can climb through different stages of consciousness to realize that. That's the big Indian's message. Number two is the idea of everything is interconnected. The karma, the law of causality. Something happens here, a ripple goes through the whole universe. Whatever you think or do or say has consequences. We're interconnected. The third one, and, and this is, uh, you know, shows you the interconnected of dance and the world. The third one is this idea of yoga. Now, think about it. There, we have tried and tested methods of traveling both inwards and outwards to the farthest end of the cosmos or to the DNA, to the string level and vibrating at that level but all in our mind. We actually can train our minds to do that. So that's a huge contribution. The next one, which is the fourth one, is this idea of a conscious evolution. That means you actually can evolve your consciousness with these practices. You can become a better human being. You can become nonviolent. You can have compassion. You can develop kindness. These are all fundamental to evolution. That's a very Indian idea. And finally, the biggest promise of all is this idea that if you know that everything is mind, that you are part of this cosmos that's evolving, that you can connect to that, and that you can evolve to be a better human being, then Indian wisdom makes a huge promise to you. It's called Sat Chit Ananda. And Sat Chit Ananda is translated as truth, consciousness, and ultimate bliss. So what is it that Indian wisdom can give us? Well. If you follow Indian wisdom, you don't need to just follow your bliss, as Joseph Campbell would say, but your bliss will actually follow you. Thank you.